I'm gonna give them time to get here. Okay. Okay. That's my opinion. Yeah. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لسان يفقه قولي اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا ربنا زدنا علما نافعا أمين يا رب العالمين So we're going to carry on إن شاء الله تعالى with our reading of um, sections from the Shamail of Imam At-Tirmidhi rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi and I just wanted to, just because I got a question last week and it sort of bugged me for the whole week so I thought I'd, I'd start with trying to answer that and the question was an easy one, they asked what is love? and this is a gathering of love, I hope because the affair of Islam is an affair of love in its essence because it was only love that caused Allah ta'ala to bring us into existence out of non-existence and it's only love that forces us to gravitate towards him, Jalla wa'ala. And so love, as Imam al-Ghazali mentions, is the gravitation of the soul towards somebody or something. And the ultimate gravitation that the soul always has is to its creator. And then any being that reflects towards the creator, any door to the creator is then also loved. And there is no door greater to Allah than Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa because he's Allah's beloved. He's Allah's beloved. And that's what's powerful about that is that in, that in him, there's a meeting of Allah's love and the Ummah's love in the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so the ulama, they break love, they demarcate it into two types. They say there's love, which is rational love, and then there's love that's emotional. And they start with rational love. Rational love is the idea that you should love him, that he deserves your love. That you recognize that there is no being who is of more benefit to you than him. And that whatever there is in existence is only through him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is what the ulama say. Because everything Allah Ta'ala gives is because of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is the reason for the bestowal of bounty. And so that recognition that he is the one to be loved. Whether you have that emotional love for him or not. At the very least... If I don't love him, I should love him. He should be the most beloved to me. And that's the hadith of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu. When he comes to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa and he says, I love you more than anything. Because the Prophet sallallahu said, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه من نفسه ووالده 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 والناس أجمعين. That none of you truly believes until I am more beloved to him than his wealth, his children, his parents, and himself in totality. And Sayyidina Umar says, Ya Rasul, I love you more than anything except myself. Right now, at this moment in time, I'm, I'm on the top of the priority list. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, well, you have not yet, Umar. It hasn't, you haven't got it yet. And then Sayyidina Umar, in, in a moment, says, now you're the most beloved to me. And then he says to Rasulullah ﷺ, Al-an, ya Rasulullah, now ya Rasulullah. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Al-an, ya Umar. Now, Umar. That's the recognition, that, that that's the love of, of, of the mind. That the mind knows that he should be the most beloved to you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And, and you force yourself to live life in accordance with that fact. Whether you, whether you truly believe it or not, in the sense that you truly feel it. And then the second love is the emotional love. Hubbul atifa. And that's the emotional love. Like the love a mother has for her children. Because your children could be the worst, the most despicable being on the face of this earth. But, you know, in the eyes of its mother, even the monkey is a gazelle. That you just have this gravitation of love. You just see goodness in them. And emotional love has many reasons, but Imam al-Ghazali rahmatullahi breaks it down into two main things that will make you fall in love with somebody. Our beauty, and who is more beautiful than Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That literally they were just enraptured by him as he was physical perfection sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then the second reason that you'd fall in love with somebody is because of a goodness they've done to you. And, and really the test, because they say love has fruits, right? 
So you know love by certain things. And, and one of the things for love is that you obey or you do everything in your power for the beloved. You do everything to bring happiness to the beloved. And if you look at the reverse, what didn't the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do for those that he loved? For his ummah. And so you recognize that there's nobody that's done a greater goodness to you than the Messenger of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the moment you rationalize that is by recognizing that what would have happened if he wasn't here? Where would you be? Lawla Muhammad lakuntu majus. Imam Ahmad ibn Muhammad, if, it, if the Prophet ﷺ didn't exist, I would have been a Zoroastrian. I would have been a fire worshipper. Where would you be without? Like Malcolm X used to say, if it wasn't for Islam, I'd be dead or in prison. That's the recognition. That you have this incredible love for the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. So Imam al-Ghazali says, you can look at the most beautiful people. And there's people that you fall in love with. Like he says, you look at the bravery of Imam Ali or the generosity of Sayyidina Uthman. And you start to gravitate towards these people. And then you realize the Prophet ﷺ is ajma of all of them. That he's the fountain from which they all came from, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so he, and then you, then you think who Allah is. Because he's the creator of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it's just this mind-blowing thing. And so the idea being, and I just wanted to emphasize this point, though, because love has, has fruits by which you know it. And the greatest form of the fruit of love is obedience. Because how can you claim to love somebody and not do what they want you to do? And anybody who does that, then they are they false in their claim of love. The tree of love is very weak. And the second is, there's so many things that the ulama mentioned, but I wanted to mention one that I think is very powerful. And this is, this is why we're here. Is that you fall in love with the traces of them. That anything that reminds you of them, you're in. Like, like the Prophet because he loves Sayyidah Khadija, and, she, and her sister Hala, or daughter in some narrations. There's a narration that she comes, she just walked past the house, and the Prophet was running out. And he's shouting, Hala, Hala. Because he remembered Sayyidah Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. And then he honored her because she was Sayyidah Khadija's family radiallahu anha. That you see when he saw her necklace and he just begins to weep. That moment that, and then that's how Busiri starts the burda. I mean, Is it from those neighbors? Do you remember the neighbors that were at the salam near Medina? Do you remember the neighbors who lived near Medina? And you think about them and then you just start to cry because you, you remember the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this action that we're doing, the reading of the hadith, I read this incredible statement that said that the Sahaba were people who spent time with the nafs of the Prophet And the scholars of hadith are those who spent time with the nafs, the breath of the Messenger of Allah And so all of these readings, we are in the prophetic, the presence of the prophetic breath. That these are moments that the Prophet spoke, he moved, he said, he did, he looked, he heard, he smelled, he sweated, anything he did. We're in that presence as we read this text. And so I just wanted to, I don't know if that answers what is love. And Allah Ta'ala only knows best. But I thought, and these are snapshots. Everything we're going to read, I just, people had a moment with the Messenger of Allah and, and I think people will realize that as we go on. So I wanted to read one more narration from the first chapter. And then we're going to move on to the Khatam. And then we're going to move on to the other chapters, inshallah. And so I just, because I found this one, is a very beautiful narration. So, بِسَنَدِ الْمُتَّصِلِ مِنَّا إِلَىٰ صَاحِبِ الْكِتَابِ إِمَامَ أَبُوْ عِيسَى مُحَمَّدْ بِنْ عِيسَى الْتِلْمِذِي رَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ تَعَلَىٰ عَلَيْهِ I feel like it's hadith 15 or something in the first chapter, if people have the shamayl open in front of them. But I'm not 100% certain. And when I say the shamayl, the full 410 hadith version, not just uh, like a summarized version. So he says, it's just that, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and I just, just the first line, he says, عُرِضَ and this is the Prophet ﷺ describing the prophets that he saw. And he says, the prophets of Allah were presented to me. And the ulama says, straight away you have a recognition of who he is. Because he's not presented to them. They're brought for him to observe, to inspect, to look at. And to recognize that every single prophet that came before the Messenger of Allah ﷺ is, is in anticipation of him. They're just, they're just a step before the Messenger of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's every Prophet's journey, is just to set the stage for the coming of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, and the reverse of that is true, in that the Dajjal, as in the Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, every fitna is a preparation for the great fitna. All fitna will lead up to the great fitna of the Antichrist who will come near the end of times. And so you have these two, but they never meet. And one of the reasons the ulama give that the Prophet ﷺ never fights the Dajjal and say Sayyidina Isa, there's a few reasons, but one of the reasons they give, because then it's not a fair fight. Because the Prophet ﷺ would wipe the floor with Dajjal in an instant. It wouldn't even be a competition. And he would say, Sayyidina Isa is not even a competition. So the word of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. So he says, ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ says, the Prophets are presented to me. 
And so he either saw them in a dream state or he saw them in, um, in the Mi'raj. Either in Baytul Maqdis or one of the places he sees all of the prophets are presented to him. And we have various narrations that he sees. The prophet. He saw Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam at the Kaaba and things like that. So we have this idea that the Prophet would see the prophets. And also the, the belief of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah that the prophets are alive. Because the Prophet saw them. Well, what did he see? He saw them. And if it's them, then they're alive. <laughs> Because who did he see? And he was there in a wakeful state. So the Prophet ﷺ starts, he says, فَإِذَا مُوسَى عَلَيْهِ السلام. And suddenly there was Moses. And I saw Musa ﷺ. He was, he, was, he was a man. Like he was a specimen of, of masculinity. Like he was a man. I saw Musa ﷺ. And some say darb means that he was slim. That Sayyidina Musa ﷺ is slim. And what we know about Sayyidina Musa ﷺ is that he's dark skinned and he has curly hair. About Sayyidina Musa ﷺ. And then he says, كَأَنَّهُمْ مِنْ رِجَالِ شَنُوءَ As if he's from the men of Shanu'a, which are the men from Yemen. So Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam looks like a Yemeni man. Then he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَرَأَيْتُ عِيسَى بْنَ مَرْيَمْ alayhi salam. Then I saw Jesus, the son of Mary, alayhi salam. فَإِذَا أَقْرَبَ مَنْ رَأَيْتُ بِهِ شَبَهًا عُرْوَ إِبْنَ مَسْعُودِ And the closest person I ever saw that looked like and see, the Prophet doesn't say this for Sayyidina Musa because there's nobody who looks like Sayyidina Musa. But for Isa, he says it's Urwa ibn Mas'ud, a thaqafi radiallahu anhu, is a companion of the Prophet from the land of Ta'if. Who is, a, who is actually, when the conquest of Mecca, when they do Sulah Hudaybiyah, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, he comes from the side of the Quraysh to, to negotiate against the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa Later he accepts Islam and he goes to the Prophet and he seeks permission that can I, do I have permission to call my people to Islam? And the Prophet ﷺ gives him permission, knowing that there is a musibah that's going to hit him. And they say he gets back to Ta'if and he climbs the building and he begins to give the adhan. And they shot him with arrows and they martyred him. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And then the Prophet ﷺ would say he is like the man from Surah Yasin. Uh, or until uh, that he's martyred because he tells them to follow the prophets. So he says, Sayyidina Urwa ibn Mas'ud radiallahu is like Sayyidina. Um, and we know what Sayyidina Isa looks like, by the way. Because we have, we know, because the Prophet described him in so much detail in anticipation for his coming, that he's coming. And so we know exactly, we know that he has long hair and he's got pale skin. And when he comes, the water is going to be as if water is descending. And, and he's going to descend on the wings of the two angels and, and things like that. And we know exactly the, the minaret of the Umayyad Masjid, the white minaret is where Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam is going to descend. The Prophet gives this immense description. Because, in a, because he knows there's going to be people who come near the end of time who reject the descent. So he's like, when he comes, you better, you better accept that it's him. Because you know what he's going to look like. And then the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa says, وَرَأَيْتَ Ibrahim alayhi salam. And I saw Ibrahim, Ibrahim alayhi salam. فَإِذَا أَقْرَبُوا مَنْ رَأَيْتُ بِهِ شَبَهًا صَاحِبُكُمْ And the closest in resemblance to Sayyidina Ibrahim is your companion. And by your companion, he's talking about who? Himself, sallallahu alayhi wa I look like Ibrahim, because he's my grandfather. So that's why the resemblance between me and my grandfather is such that I look like Sayyidina Ibrahim looks like me and I look like him. And then he says, يَعْنِي نَفْسَهُ So the narrator says, that's what he means himself. Kalam, فَإِذَا أَقْرَبُوا مَنْ رَأَيْتُ بِهِ شَبَهًا دِحْيَا and the closest in resemblance to Sayyidina Jibra'il is Dihya Kalbi radiallahu anhu, who was said, they say about him, he was the most beautiful of the companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So much so that when he would travel a land, they would have to lock up their women in their houses so they wouldn't go out to look at him. And that's how incredibly beautiful he was as a Sahabi. But when Jibreel alayhi salam would descend, he would descend in his form. And Umm Salma saw him. And when the Prophet alayhi salam said, did you see who I was speaking to? And she says, I saw Dihya. But it wasn't Dihya. And the Prophet ﷺ would use him as an ambassador. That when he would want to send a message, he would send Dihya Kalbi. As like, this is what Muslims are like. They're all in, they all look like this. <laughs> They're all incredibly beautiful. And then that's the hadith that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu uh, alayhi wasallam. That's that hadith. And I wanted to finish with that one. Um, and the final one in that chapter actually is this one. And I'll do it very quickly. Is that um, one, of the, one of the tabi'een says, I heard Abu Tufail say, and I just, it's just the wording he says at the beginning I find very powerful. He says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I saw the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa ma baqiya ala wajhil ardi ahadun ra'ahu ghayri. And at this moment in time, there's no one remaining on the face of this earth who's seen him except from me. So this is a narration from the last of the companions, who's now saying that I was Allah, I saw him, and at this moment in time, I am the last of the Sahaba who remains upon this earth. And they say he lived a very long life. 
after the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam His name is Amir ibn Wathila radiyallahu ta'ala anhu And the commentaries have more detail upon who he is And قلته, and then I said, describe him to me He said, kana abyad, he was white-skinned uh, Malihan, he was beautiful uh, Muqassadan, everything about him was in proportion Or medium size Okay, so now what I want to do is بَامُ مَا جَاءَ فِي خَاتَمِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم The chapter on the seal of the prophethood the seal of prophethood that the prophet sallallahu had so we talked about this in some in a bit of detail last week so i'm just going to i'm not going to go into it again in that much detail but i thought it'd be nice to read some riwayat on some hadith from that chapter so it starts that we know that the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and in the, the riwayah of imam ali he says that he had a khatam he had a seal so he has this mark on the back of his on his back between his two shoulders that indicates that he's the final prophet to come and it's been prophesied in the books that there's a, when the final prophet comes, he's going to have this sign on the back, on his back, that will indicate towards him being the final prophet. And the sign, as far as we know, is this sort of protrusion of skin that's coming out of him that looks like it's protruding like a pigeon egg, and it has spots around it. And and in various descriptions, the Sahaba give to the extent that some Sahaba said it's it's like camel dung, it's like dung. It's like little spots or warts that he has on his back, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it's the size of a pigeon egg, and at times it would increase to the size of a clinched fist. So it would increase in size. And these are things that we know. And it would be on the left-hand side of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa back. Because that's where the heart is. And they say that from when the first revelation was to be given, when Jibreel, alayhi salam, descends to open him up and to do the cleaning, from that moment, according to the most dominant opinion, the seal of prophecy is put on his back. And now at this point, anybody who now sees, because he's, he's Bu'ith, he's been sent now. Like when he went on the Mi'raj and they asked, who are Bu'ith? Has he been sent? Now he's, he's been sent as a prophet. So now you, he has the mark. And now people will come looking for it. To the extent that they would literally, like in one narration, one of the Sahaba literally just, from because he's got his top open, he just grabs it, he just puts his hand inside for a feel. And he feel because they felt so comfortable in his presence, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And 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 sometimes the Prophet would know that they were coming in anticipation of it, and he would say, you, "This is what you want," and he would take off his shirt or whatever in order to show them the seal. Uh, but like we mentioned last week, if you didn't know any better, you'd assume there was an abnormality with him, which is why when Abu Rimtha comes, they say, "Oh, uh, I'm a doctor. I'll fix that for you." And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, "You're not a doctor. Allah's a doctor, so don't worry about it." But the sign is there that the Prophet ﷺ has this mark on his back. And there's various narrations that it has hair that surrounds it and things. So what I wanted to do, um, inshallah, is just to read some of the hadith on that chapter. Um, and because I think some of them are very beautiful. So the first hadith is literally the first hadith, hadith number 16. Where Sa'ib ibn Yazid says, I went, ذَهَبَتْ بِخَالَتِي إِلَىٰ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم Once, my auntie took me to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam فَقَالَتْ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ So she said, يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ إِنَّ بْنَ أُخْتِي وَجِعٌ That my, my, son, the, my nephew has a, a problem. He has some sort of physical problem. And some say that there was something in his foot. That something had happened to his foot. He was injured. And then he says, and, and he's a child. This is important. He's a child at the time that he goes to see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then, فَمَسَحَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم رأسي. He says, the Prophet وسلم, which was the habit of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, This is from the Sunan of the, the Prophet of God. When he would see children, he would pass his hand over them. To the extent that once they saw, Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم, Sayyidina Anas bin Malik رضي الله عنه, Thabit al-Bunani. They saw Thabit al-Bunani, who is a student, the main student of Sayyidina Anas bin Malik. They say, we saw him once in Iraq and he was passing his hand over children. And they said, why do you do this? And he said, once I used to see Sayyidina Anas bin Malik, all the time he would see a child, he would wipe his hand over them. I said to Anas ibn Malik, why do you do this? He said, when we lived in Medina, whenever the Prophet ﷺ saw a child, he would wipe his hand over them. And wada'a, and he would make dua for their barak for barakah for them. And to the extent that if the Prophet ﷺ passed his hand over you, the least that would happen is your hair would never turn white and you would never lose any hair. That's the minimum that would happen. Minimum. And that's why that we know that even the Jews of Medina would pretend to sneeze in the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so he would say, Yarhamukallah. Because they knew that something would happen when he said that. To, that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he would make, he, he says about himself from the Khasais, that if I make a bad dua on a person, Allah Ta'ala transforms it into a dua for them. That even his curses are a blessing. 
Everything about the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi is goodness Everything about him And so when he wipes his hand over the child There's a guarantee something's going to happen So Sayyidina Sa'ib ibn Yazid radiallahu anhu is saying That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wiped his hand over my head And they say Later his students say One of them says I met Sa'ib ibn Yazid He was 94 years old His hearing was intact His eyesight was intact and his body was as supple as that of a young man. From that moment, what, what do we know? Maybe, maybe there's something he fought a Badr and Uhud and I don't know. But maybe that was it. Maybe that's all we know about Sahib ibn Yazid that once he walked in front of the Prophet or his foot was hurting, his auntie took him to the Messenger of Allah she wiped, he wiped his hand uh, over his head and that's all. And that would be with him for the rest of his life now. And, and, and that's it, that's the effect That he, Nothing, nothing, no physical abnormality Would ever come to him Because of that moment that the messenger of God Sallallahu alayhi wa wiped his hand over his head So he says the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa Wiped his hand over my head bil baraka, And he made the dua for me For barakah, blessings وتوضأ, And he made wudu min wudu'ihi. So I drank from the wudu water وَقُمْتُ خَلْفَ ظَهْرِهِ Then I stood up behind him and I looked to the seal. I looked for the seal. I saw the seal. And he says it was like a pigeon egg. That's one of his descriptions that he sees. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. But that's, that was, I, I found that a very beautiful hadith about the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa Just that one moment that he wipes and something amazing happens. Um, the next one I wanted to read is this one's a long one, but we'll see how this one goes, inshallah. But this is hadith. Sayyidina Salman al-Farisi radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So we're not going to read the full hadith. So all we know, what we know about Sayyidina Salman al-Farisi radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he is the embodiment to, you know there's an, there's an idea, Shaykh Abdullah Sa'id al-Lahji quotes, that he is from the rijal, that ishtaqat al-jannah ilayhi, that jannah yearns for him, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu. And he's, he's got that uniqueness that Salman minna ahl al-bayt, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Salman is from ahl al-bayt, and the Prophet ﷺ had this immense affection because the story of Salman, which we don't definitely can't go into in detail, is this of this man who grows up in this. His father's literally like the grand priest or whatever of the fire worshippers in Persia of the locality he lives in, and he goes through this immense journey because he hears Nabi Akhir Zaman, the, the Prophet of the final age is to come, and I have to find him. And he has this incredible story of he goes to like charlatans, these dodgy Christian priests who are stealing people's wealth. He tells this long story and he gets to Medina because he gets captured as a slave. He says, I was looking for him. I never found him. I got, they captured me. Uh, I, my companions, I was traveling with them. They, they took me hostage. They, they took me as a slave and they brought me to Medina. He was, this is, this is karam. This is something special. May Allah drag us to Medina also. But he's dragged to Medina. Out of his, he has no will. He's just taken. Allah brought him to Medina. But he's a slave now. And then he's going to go now. He says, now I decide. He's, he's heard of the Prophet. And he, we know that he was looking and he was waiting and he heard of the hijrah and he's climbing the tree and, and, and all of this. And, but he comes and now he's going to narrate what happened when he saw the Prophet ﷺ for the first time. And he's looking for the khatam. Because he's heard there's going to be a seal. So he's got three signs. That the Prophet of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam does not accept charity. That the Messenger of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will only accept, will accept gifts. And finally that he has a seal, a mark between his shoulders that, is a fi- that shows the finality of his prophethood Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So now Sayyidina Salman al-Farisi radiallahu ta'ala anhu in this narration is going to narrate the story. And so he says, Ja'a Salman al-Farisi ila Rasulillahi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam hina qadim al madina Salman al-Farisi came to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa when he first arrived in Medina. This is hadith number 21. Bima'idatin alayha rutabun with a table spread upon which were dates. And some ulama say there were other stuff. He bought like a proper meal for the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa So he places it in front of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa And then mu'jizah, straight away mu'jizah. Faqala ya Salman. He says, oh Salman, ma hadha, what is this? And he's never met him before. This is going to be a recurring theme about the Messenger of Allah Is that he knows your name. He knows your name. 
and we'll come to the narration if we have time today about the fact that he would name things. We spoke about it briefly last week that the Prophet named everything he owned. His clothes had a name, his turbans had a name, his sword had a name, his camels had names, his, uh, his mule had a name. It was called Dul Dul. These are everything he gave names, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But here, Salman comes, he's never met the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam before. And some people say, well, no, maybe he met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam before. But most of the ulama are like, no, this is mu'ajizah. That as soon as he came, and he's coming with a yearning for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And as soon as he comes, the first thing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says to him, just, to, ya Salman, oh Salman, like we already know who you are. We know why you're here. So, mahad, what is this? Why have you bought this? And so he says, Sadaqatun alayka. This is charity. I bought it as charity for you. Wa ala ashabik and upon your companions. Faqala idfa'ha fa inna la na'kulu sadaqa. Don't take it away from here because indeed we do not eat from charity. And some say, what does it mean when he says we? And some people say it's the royal we. We, yani Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But this is not becoming of the humility of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it seems what he's saying here is we the prophets or we Ahlul Bayt. Either his family or the family of prophets, either of his two families, he's saying we do not eat from charity, because you know, and I'm not, you know, but the, the you know the, the prophet ﷺ said the worst of earning money is to seek from others, that people should earn their money by their own right, and if people are giving you wealth, it's a sign of neediness, and the prophet ﷺ has no neediness to anybody, never. Because about Sayyidina Ibrahim والسلام, when he's being thrown in the fire and Jibreel والسلام, comes. Uh, and he says, Alaka haja. Like as he's being flung in the fire, and Jibreel alayhi salam comes mid flight and says, Do you have a need? And, J- and Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, looks at him and says, Amma ilayka fala. As for you, I have no need. So you can go. Because I have a need from Allah Ta'ala. But the Messenger of God وسلم, can have no dependence on anyone but Allah. And so sadaqah is prohibited for him because it's, it's demeaning of his status. And I don't mean this in any disrespect to people for whatever reason financially have to claim charity But the point being that it's not for the Prophet of God to claim charity So he says we do not take And he says He lifted it He came the next day with it again He put it in front of the Messenger of Allah He said what is this O Salman He said This is a gift for you فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وسلم, Straight away, as soon as it's given as a gift, the first thing the Messenger of God وسلم, said, فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ لِأَصْحَابِهِ He says to his companions, أُبْسُطُوا Spread it out. And there's various meanings. What does this mean? Some say it means spread out, give space for Salman to come and eat from his own gift. Or it means cause, give happiness to Salman by eating the food that he's given to us. Or just put out the, the, the ma'idah and let's eat together. And then... So then the, the, the companions, they all eat with the Prophet Sallallahu and Sayyidina Salman radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Then they say later, now Salman is two down, he's got one left. Then later, one day he says the Prophet Sallallahu went to the graveyard in Baqi. Because the Prophet Sallallahu used to routinely go to visit the graveyard nearly every week. And so the Prophet Sallallahu has gone to the graveyard and Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu comes now for the final moment. This is the decider really. And he comes, and now he says, the narrator says, ثُمَّ نَظَرَ إِلَى الْخَاتِمِ So he now, at the graveyard, he gazes upon the seal of prophethood that the Prophet ﷺ has, عَلَى ظَهْرِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وسلم, Upon the back of the Messenger of Allah صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم, فَآمَنَ بِهِ And he takes belief with him. And they say at this moment, Salman al-Farisi, they, he wrote down, he just broke down. On the third, the moment, it's finally, after everything he went through, to find the Messenger of God صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم, because he had, he had an idea of the value of, of, of the Prophet And at the moment now he finally gets This is him This is who I've been looking for All this time They say he breaks down He just bakai, just cries and cries and cries I, Probably in the arms of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Why? SubhanAllah And then he says وَكَانَ لِلْيَهُودِ فَاشْتَرَاهُ That Sayyidina Salman radiallahu ta'ala anhu at this point in time was owned by a Jewish man. So then he buys the, the فَاشْتَرَاهُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ بِكَذَا وَكَذَا دِرْهَمًا That the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa sallam buys him. 
but he doesn't buy him. What the Prophet ﷺ does is what's called kitabah, that the Prophet ﷺ says, he makes an agreement that once Salman al-Farisi radiallahu ta'ala anhu will give, and the ulama say 5,000 dirhams. Once he gives his owner 5,000 dirhams, he will have bought his freedom. And he has to, uh, he has to um, plant 300 date palm trees. That's, what, that's the agreement that's been given now. So he's got freedom, but they've put these, these stringent conditions that he has to give 5,000 dirhams and he has to plant three, 300 date palm trees. And so they say that the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa as soon as that happened, he turned to the companions and he said, I'll go help Salman. And the Sahaba came together, all together, and they and the Prophet ﷺ himself, and they began to help Salman al-Farisi radiallahu ta'ala who planted the date palm trees. That the Sahaba came together in this moment to help him. And what would happen is the Messenger of God وسلم, he'd be the one that they, they'd bring him or do whatever. I don't know how you plant date palm trees. but And then the Prophet ﷺ would put the final touch into the planting process, like putting the seeds into the ground or whatever it was. فَيَعْمَلُ سَلْمَانُ فِيهِ حَتَّى تُطْعِمَ That Salman radiallahu anhu kept doing it until it was fulfilled. فَغَرَسَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ النخلة, That the Prophet ﷺ planted all of them. إِلَّا نَخْلَةً وَاحِدَةً غَرَسَهَا عُمَرُ He planted all of them except one that Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu planted. فَحَمْلَةِ النَّخْلُ مِنْ عَامِهَا وَلَمْ تَخْمِ النَّخْلَ The condition was as soon as they bear fruit, then the condition is fulfilled. So they say every single one of them get bore fruit much earlier than was anticipated. So the freedom was done. Except for one. So the Messenger of God says, What is the problem with this date palm tree? Umar, Sayyidina Umar says, Oh Messenger of Allah, I am the one who planted this one. And so, the Prophet pulls it out. And he puts it back in. And then it does, and it, and it, and it has that same miracle that is done in the, in the time that the others were done, in, in a much quicker time. And then remember Sayyidina Salman radiallahu ta'ala who by the way still has 5,000 dirhams to give and he doesn't have the money and they say literally it's one day some money came to the messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa and the first thing he said because this was his nature he would get it and he would see who was in need and he would he said go has, go give this to Salman and Sayyidina Salman radiallahu anhu says I took it and I found it to be the exact amount that was needed for my freedom and I paid it to the man and then Sayyidina Salman radiallahu ta'ala who gets his freedom and so that's the, the final hadith that we're going to read um, on the, uh, the khatim of the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that brings us to the next chapter, which is Babu ma jaa fi sha'ri rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The chapter on the the hair of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam So what we're going to try and do is combine all of these So this would be the hair of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And the combing of the hair that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did And so what we do know about the hair of the Messenger of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Is that the Prophet of God had uh, Generally All his life He had long hair And He had um, Either The ulama Or The, the, the it's very complex, the descriptions of the hair of the Prophet ﷺ. Because hair, and this is what Sheikh Zakir Khan Dahlu mentions in his commentary, it grows. Because, so they're all seeing it at different moments. So they're going to say that his hair was at this length and it was up to his ears or it was below his ears or it was up to his shoulders. But generally, either the Messenger of Allah ﷺ would grow his hair up to his shoulders if he was letting it grow, or if he cut it, he would cut it up to his earlobes. That was the extent to shortening the hair that the Messenger of God ﷺ did. And only when he did the Umrah or the Hajj would he shave his head, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So generally, the idea that we have about the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is that his hair is very long, or at least longer than the, what we assume is conventional. And this seems to be abnormal in comparison to the rest of his companions. Because Sayyidina Imam Ahmad, rahimullah ta'ala, makes mention something to the effect that only nine of the companions of the Prophet, sallallahu had hair. But what he means is not hair, he means as in long hair. So that's, I mean, that's a narration from the Musnad that he narrates from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But we have, I was going to go through it when we get to the white hair of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but the Messenger of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there were Sahaba who were bold. So there is no, like there's a fadila obviously in having long hair, 
But boldness is not something that diminishes anything. Because in Umar radiallahu anhu was bold, in Ali ibn Abi Talib used to shave his hair, Imam Malik was known for being bold. But the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa sallam without, because, and one of the reasons they're going to give, and this is going to come as a recurring theme as it's come before, is that he, has, he can't be found unattractive. Not even for a moment. And he has to be, and I was thinking about this, he has to be universally attractive. Because he is kafat al all people. He's not the Arab's prophet, he's everybody's prophet. So everybody has to have, he has to have qualities about him that no matter what culture you're from, what locality you're from, what context you're from, what lens you're looking at, he has to be attractive to you. Because to reject him is kufr. And nothing about him can be in any way enabling of kufr. That's the way you have to see him. So he is beautiful in every, he's objectively beautiful. Sallallahu alayhi wa and so from that beauty that the Messenger of God said, and when it comes to the hair, they say generally women would find it unattractive. That either he has white hair or he has uh, no hair. And that's why the Prophet has, has this hair. Um, and so it comes at these uh, varying lengths. And the narration of Umhani that we'll make mention of here, that she says, and this is astonishing as well, is that when the Prophet وسلم, entered Mecca to al as the conqueror of Mecca, he had four braids in his hair. And so the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa at times when his hair was very long, he would braid his hair. And so there were braid, two braids on the left-hand side and two braids on the right-hand side. And that's how the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sometimes would have his hair. And so, and they say his braids were not feminine in that they differed from the way women's braids are. Um, whatever that might mean. Because I think it's something like his hair, the, the, the angles that it would come out would not be the same as the way women's hair would do. Um, and that, and, and so the Prophet, and Sayyidina Abu Ubaidah Tamil al-Jarrah radiallahu ta'ala who is also known for this, that they would braid their hair, the companions of the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so that's just a point to make about like this idea that, you know, like, oh, that, you know, the, the hairstyle somebody has sort of diminishes their status or he is the greatest rajul, the man that ever existed. And he had braids in his hair at times. And that's because, then that's just, I, I just find that as an incredible thing to think about in the context of what it means to be a man. So that's the hair on his head, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He has kathif, he has a thick beard, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And because we, we've been through this in his description, but his beard would reach, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the top of his chest. And it was, it was a sufficiently large beard. In that we mentioned before that the sahaba could see movement in his beard, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he would lead the prayer. So you could see that there was something definitely there. Um, and that the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, um, he had a moustache, and it seems like the Messenger of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would, both the beard and the moustache, he would, he, would, he would clean them up. He would neaten them. And for the moustache, he would use a miswak as a line, as like a ruler, in order to clean the hair. But the sirih lihya, that he would actually look after his beard, that he wouldn't just keep it disheveled and dirty. It was something that, that was something to be done. Um, and, and, and also, that the Messenger of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he would get worried, they say he would touch his beard. That would be like um, his reaction. And if he was sad, then he would grab the beard and, 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 and just sort of be in fikrah. He would just be in thought, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so that's the point that, that's one of the things that's mentioned. About the combing of the head. Now, I did send uh, a picture. We have, one of the ulama has, using what the Hijazis have as a comb, we have potential idea of what the comb of the Messenger of God وسلم, looked like because the, we have an idea of what the combs of the Arabs of that age looked like and one of them is literally like a little sword and one of them is like a little trident and that's what they would use to comb and so the Messenger of God وسلم, Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says um, or many companions can uh, narrate about the Messenger of Allah وسلم, Kana yatarajjalu ghibban, that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, would every now and then comb that the Prophet ﷺ wouldn't comb his hair all the time. This, because because it's it's vanity, it's vanity to be com to be obsessed with your appearance. The Prophet ﷺ was not obsessed with his appearance. One of the things that the Messenger of God ﷺ has, and you'll see this a lot with his clothes and his hair, everything has to be clean. Nadafa, he has to be clean. There can be no dirt. When the Prophet ﷺ saw a man whose beard was dirty or completely all over the place, the Messenger of God ﷺ said, "Does he not have a comb that he can take care of himself?" Does he not have anything that he can... And when he saw that his clothes were dirty, he said, does he not have anything to wash his clothes? Does that man... And he didn't even say, he didn't say to him, oh, you listen, why don't you wash your clothes? He just said it in a general comment to the Sahaba, because he would never pinpoint people out. 
sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because then they they get aggressive and things like that but the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would not comb his hair all the time occasionally the messenger of god sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would comb his hair but he would have a comb with him generally he would keep a comb and he would keep itar and he would keep a pillow and he would keep a mirror and he would keep a miswak and they say generally those five things would never leave the company of the messenger of allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wherever he went um and then the messenger of god sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and, and then the Prophet ﷺ also says, there's a hadith, that if you have hair, فَلْيُكْرِمْهُ If you have hair, honor your hair. Honor it, look after it. Because if Allah Ta'ala has given it to you as a gift, then make sure you maintain it as best you possibly can. And especially in, 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 in regards to uh, beautifying yourself for a spouse. And then make sure that you look after yourself in order that uh, the marriage doesn't break down. Um, but that the Prophet ﷺ himself wouldn't always be combing his hair, sallallahu alayhi wa and then the next point that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, this is the hadith of uh, Sayyidina Anas bin Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that, that the Kana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yukthiru dahna ra'sihi wa tasriha lihitihi. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would many times, he would oil his head sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he would clean his beard, neaten his beard sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa yukthiru al qina hatta ka'anna thawbahu thawbu zayyat. And he would wear a head veil. So I, that's, that's a point I, I'll just go into because it's to do with his clothing. Now, what does it mean that the Prophet ﷺ would wear like a veil over his head? Now, one meaning is that the Messenger of God ﷺ, when he would oil his hair, he would wear this head covering so that the oil would not spread to his turban. And this is the, the very sort of, uh, sort of rational way. This is the way the ulama, some ulama have rationalized it. And then you go to like, the, like Bajuri and Imam al-Manawi and others, and they say, no, 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 you've misunderstood the qanna. Because Abdullah bin Mas'ud says, veiling is from the characteristics of the prophets. And this is not just a veiling. This is the idea that the messenger of God وسلم, would close himself off from the dunya by virtue of the veil that he wore. To the extent that they mentioned that his veil would also cover parts of his face. وسلم, and part of it is from the hayat that the messenger of God وسلم, had. Immensely conscious. And the Sahaba, this is, you know, there's even ideas that when the Sahaba would go to make istinja, when they would go to the bathroom, far from their homes, they, they would actually cover themselves even more so because they knew Allah was watching. That they had this idea that Allah's gaze is upon me, and so they would cover themselves even more in, in, in shame from Allah. And so some ulama say this is what taqannu is. That the Prophet ﷺ from, from being in a state of modesty, from the idea that Allah's gaze was upon him, would, would, would hide himself away. And then allowing himself to close off from everything of the dunya and just to be in the presence of his Lord. And everything else is removed from his presence. And then they say that this, this qina is like a khalwa. This is his khalwa. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so that's one of the meanings the ulama have given. And then another point related to this, and this is going to be another recurring theme, is tayamun. That the Messenger of God وسلم, would try to do nearly everything that had any semblance of goodness in it, the Prophet وسلم, would do from the start from the right hand side. The right hand side. And because goodness is that the people of Jannah are described in the Quran as Ashabul Yameen, are the people of the right hand side. And the right hand side has an immense blessing in it. So the Prophet ﷺ would do everything good with the right hand side. And it was an idea of tafa'ul. That the Prophet ﷺ was seeking. It's the closest thing we have as an idea. It's probably like good luck. But that's not a good translation. But it's like the Prophet ﷺ was, was, was just hopeful in every situation. That everything, it's like a dua. That in the moment that he does it, he does it with the right hand side in accordance that it, that it, in the hope that it becomes, go, comes into accordance with the divine will. And Allah Ta'ala will bestow blessings upon him for doing what he's about to do. Like, uh, like uh, istikhara, being that you, you don't ask Allah to give you something. Instead, you ask Allah to give you whatever he was going to give you anyways. And just that he places goodness in it. And so it's a seeking of goodness in the actions of the Prophet ﷺ would do. So when he would comb, he would start from the right hand side. When he would put on his clothes, he would start from the right hand side. When he would put on his shoes, he would start from the right hand side. When he would enter his home, he would enter with the right hand side. When you leave your home, you also leave with the right hand side. Because you hope there's goodness and you walk in outside as well. When you enter the masjid, you enter with the right foot. Things like that. And then at the same time, the Prophet ﷺ, anything that had any evil in it, the Prophet ﷺ would do with the left hand side. As in going to the bathroom or whatever else. Things like that. And so that's another point that I thought would be an interesting one to make. Um, and so that's the, that's the discussion on 
the, the combing of the hair that the Messenger of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did and the hair of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had. Um, next is Babu Maja'a. This one's this one's an interesting one as well. I mean, they're all interesting, of course. But Babu Maja'a fi Shaybi Rasulillahi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The chapter on the white hair of the Messenger of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we'll start with this narration. This is the narration I have, and it, it, it will come up. Um, if anybody's reading from the text, it's it's uh, hadith number 41. That Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu said to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Qad shibta, that indeed you, your hair has gone white. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Shayyabatni hud. Surah hud has made my hair white. Wal waqi'ah and surah al waqi'ah. Wal mursalat and surah al mursalat. Wa amma yatasa'anun and surah al naba. Wa idha shamsu kuwirat and surah al takwir. And so there's a few points here. The first thing is that Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when he sees the Prophet and his hairs become white, some narrations actually mention that he bursts into tears at the moment that he sees this. And then they have to say, what, what happens? When, why, why be astonished at the fact that the Prophet's hair has gone white? And it was for them, it was inconceivable that anything about him would change. That everything about him was so beautiful and to perfection that the moment they saw change in them, it just absolutely it blew them away. They couldn't understand it. And, and it even could be in the idea of the anticipation that the Messenger of God وسلم, is aging and there will be a moment when his passing will come. So Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, at this moment, he sees that the white hair has started to creep in. And the Prophet وسلم, didn't have many white hairs. He didn't have many. When the Sahaba, who would count them, who would literally count the white hairs, Sayyidina Anas bin Malik, who seems like he's got so many narrations on this and they're all different numbers. So he seems like throughout his life, Whenever he gets a chance and the Prophet is sitting there, he just starts counting. One, two, three, four. And he's got from, I think, from like 10, 13, 14, 15, 17, until he gets to 20. And that's why the ulama say at his most, the Prophet had 20 white hairs. Because <laughs> that's where Sayyidina Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu reaches. But he has some white hairs. And they're not in the brunt of his. They're on like the sides of his head or on the, uh, on the, on this goatee part or whatever. I don't know what this is called in English. Um, of the beard. Uh, so he's got some white hairs And if you don't look closely enough You won't notice that they're white sometimes Because it would oil his hair so much You'd, you'd, you'd miss it Because the hair would cling together And that's why later Sayyidina Anas Radiallahu Anhu is going to say That the Prophet وسلم, When they ask him Did the Prophet وسلم, ever color his hair He will say Lam dalik. It never reached to the extent That the Prophet وسلم, would have to color his hair And the Hanafi opinion Whether it's the strongest opinion or not Is that the Prophet وسلم, Never ever used any coloring on his hair even though the, the stronger opinion, what Imam al-Nawawi says, is he used to and then he stopped. Because he didn't need to. But the Hanafis are very adamant. He never ever did it. Um, but it seems like the Shafi'is have got this one. That it seems like he may, it seems, makes more sense according to the narrations that the Prophet ﷺ may have colored his hair for a while and then he stopped dyeing it. But what we know is Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala who definitely did. And the Prophet ﷺ would recommend people to do it because um, for two reasons. For, to scare the enemy in jihad So they think you're really young and terrifying And secondly is to beautify yourself for your spouse That you look attractive But some people, like the ulama say, look attractive with white hair So they can keep the white hair And, and the, the white hair as a concept by the way In the hadith of Prophet Sallallahu says That a shayba nurul muslim That white hair is the light of a believer And that, for, that Allah Ta'ala rewards people for the white hair that they get If they got it in his path and white hair is a theme as it's a reminder of your mortality. That's what the ulama recognize it, at, recognize it as. To the extent that there's narrations about the salaf, that one of the imams of the salaf, he got white hair, they say we never saw him smile again after that. That the moment he got his first white hair, we never saw him smile again. And that's why Imam al-Busiri in the Burda has, I can't remember the line, but Nusr al-Shaybi, that my, the white hair, the advice of the white hair, What's the advice of the white hair? He's saying, it's, 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 get your act together because you're going to go soon. So, so stop messing around. Do, sort, your, sort your affairs out. And the Prophet ﷺ in another hadith says, a man who reaches 40 years has no excuse on Yawm al -Qiyamah. And some narrations 50 years and 60 years. But if you reach those ages, that's it. Allah gave you muhla. You had all that time to do all the goodness you needed to. You didn't do it, but well, that's on you. That's on you at this point. You can't, you can't blame anybody else but yourself. 
But this idea that the white hair is, is a sign of waqar, is a sign of honor that the uh, that, that many of the Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'in did have. Now, what is it about these surahs that made the Prophet Sallallahu hair go white? There, there's one thing that the Prophet Sallallahu says is that all of them have intensely graphical descriptions of the Day of Judgment. And that's what the Prophet Sallallahu is. And because his great calling, one of his great callings is going to be on the Day of Judgment. And so he has a responsibility to take care of on that day. Not just the fact that he has the Shafa'a, but he's going to be the Shaheed. That all of the Prophets are going to come and say, you know, my Ummah didn't listen to me. I called them, they didn't listen. And after all of them come, Allah Ta'ala will say to them, who's your proof? And they'll say, Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his Ummah. And at that point, we will testify with our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to that. And we have, when we come to it in the Shama'il, Babu Majafi Bukai Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the chapter on the weeping of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in the Hadith of Abdullah bin Mas'ud, Surah An-Nisa, وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَى هَؤُلَاءِ shahida. When Sayyidina Abdullah bin Mas'ud says, I reached these verses in front of him, I looked up and I saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam just crying. Because it impacted him so much. This idea that he's going to have to give the gate shahada on Yawm Al-Qiyamah against all of the nations that preceded. And another reason why, because in another narration, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, what is it about these surahs that's, that's done this to me? And in other narrations, it mentions that it's Surah Al-Haqa, Hala'ataka Hadith al ghashiya All of these are Judgment Day surahs. Iqtarabat al-Sa'atu wa al qamar Surah Al-Qari'ah. He says, Ma fu'ila bil umam qabli. What is it that's terrifying you about these surahs? He says, what was done to the nations that preceded me. In that their prophets called them, their nations didn't listen, and their nations were destroyed. And that, that scares me. And from this, the ulama derive the fear, one of the great fears that the Messenger of God وسلم, has is the fear for his ummah. That he was so worried about his ummah that the hair on his beard and hair started to turn white. I have a fear for them. For you, for us. This is like hope, right? Ihsan. Like, what, what is it? What isn't it that he did for you? What isn't it? Like everything he did for his ummah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so the fear that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had for his nation. And then the ulama say, Shaykh Abdullah say, the lehji quotes this, is that if he was so scared, why didn't all of his hair just turn white? Because we have narrations about people who would be, you know, this is our day. You have faza'ah, you get scared, and your hair just turns white. So why didn't it happen to him? All of it. And they say that he, the moment of anxiety started to cause the hair to turn white, and then his tawakkul took over. His reliance on Allah, that Allah Ta'ala will take care of my Allah. That I have that hope, for sure. That Allah Ta'ala has taken responsibility for this. And they say that stopped the hair from turning white. That his jamal overtook the jalal and that's where the victory was given. That the hair of the Prophet Sallallahu the majority of it, remained black, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that's it. And also is that um, Sayyidina, uh, that the grandfather of the Messenger of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Shayba. Abdul Muttalib's real name is Shayba. And Shaiba means what? The one with white hair. And so they say about Abdul Muttalib that he had, a, he had like a line of white hair in his, in his head. And that's why they used to call him the white-haired one. And so there's something about white hair and honor. And it was a sign of honor for them also. But the Messenger of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had some white hair. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so... Um, I'll do this one very quickly, is that we have this narration of Sayyidina Anas bin Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu. What did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi use? Uh, this is good. What did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi use on his beard and his hair? So we know he used olive oil. So he's going to use duhan and zayt and, and these things. He used saffron. We have this that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi used. Um, either he used, if he did, if the Hanafis are right, uh, wrong, but if he didn't, he would recommend the use of katam. Now, I don't know what it's, it's I think it's, it's like a type of boxwood or something, I think. I looked it up on the internet. But um, it's, a, it's a type that you get from the East. That's what the Quran is saying. It's just like so vague. Or you get it from Iran, where he used Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I would as Katam, Katam is what it is in Arabic, but I don't know what it is. I think it's boxwood or something in English. He would use rose water, Ma'ul Ward, that the Prophet Sallallahu would use on his beard. Um, and the, the Messenger of God, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would um, take care of his hair especially the more private hair that he had, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, every 15 days. And if the day fell on a Friday, it would be ideal that the Prophet sallallahu would do all of his personal grooming on a Friday. But if it didn't fall on a Friday, then the Prophet sallallahu would do it as need be. Um, and we also know that the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wasallam would, would 
um, pluck, or he would use nura or nora, which is that he would use quicklime to, and it's apparently a thing. It's 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 this white powdery thing that if you put it on your hair, it makes your hair come off. And then the messenger of God sallallahu alaihi wasallam would use that if he ever wanted to remove his hair. And then what we know about the hair of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is that the messenger of God's hair sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the great battlefield. In that the Sahaba, we know because they had his hair. And so Sayyidina Anas bin Malik radiallahu in the Shamai, there's a narration where he pulls out the hair of the Prophet وسلم, and they all get to see it and they say it's makhduban, that you could see it was, it was red, so it's been coloured. And then there's a debate, was it coloured, was it not? And most likely it wasn't, it was just he used the perfume he used, made it look like it was coloured. Because we know that most likely the Prophet وسلم, didn't colour his hair. But they kept the hair and they would, they would ask that it, and his nails. Now he generally, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, by the way, if he, if he cut his nails or cut his hair, he would bury them. He would bury his, his these, these, whatever was left from his body. And we also have the riwayah of the Jewish woman who does black magic on him, using, the, using parts of this. But the Prophet generally would bury whatever he had. But the Sahaba, ridwanullahi alayhim ajma'een, from the burial that the ulama concede is the fact that the, the Sahaba would bury it in their own bodies. And so if the Prophet وسلم, we have Abdullah bin Zubair radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when the Prophet وسلم, had cupping done and he gives him the cup and he says, go bury it when nobody's going to find it. And so he runs out and he's a, he's a child and he just grabs it and he says, well, nobody, and he drinks it. And then he comes back and he says, you know, where you, I guess I put it somewhere where nobody's going to find it. And the Prophet وسلم, knew he drank it. And then none of you is ever going to touch the hellfire. Or, or the same with, um, Allah said, is it Sayyidina Muhammad? Ah, oh, I forget. His name is Umm Ayman. But one of one of the, the, the servant folk of the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa who drank his urine. Because everything about him was pure. And so this is fine. Or the hair of the Prophet sallallahu That the Sahaba ridwanullahi alayhi wa would literally, especially when it came, because Abu Talha cuts his hair at the Hajj, and then there's a fight. Like who's going to get the hair? And they say Khalid bin Walid went for the Nasiya. He went for the hair that's on the, that, the front, the forelock. Because that's the most blessed part of a person. And he got it. Because who's going who's gonna to fight Khalid bin Walid for that? And so then that's, you know, the famous cap that he has that every battle he ever wins, he says, is because of this cap that I wear. It was because in that cap was the hair of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. These are all like proper, authentic narrations. This is not made up. This is a thing. Or they would ask that the hair that they had should be buried with them when they pass away. And when Sayyidina Anas Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away, he asked, he had a little stick that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave him and he said, bury me with this. And Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Muqas, when he buried away, passed away, he said, bury me in the shirt I wore at the Battle of Badr. But they, these moments that they had with the Messenger of Allah وسلم, were very powerful for them. Or they say, bury me with, the, with these nails in my eyes. And things like this. That's how the Sahaba, Ridwanullahi alayhim ajma'een, tabarruk. How they reacted to these, these incredible artifacts of the Messenger of God وسلم. And so they kept his hair, they kept all of these things. And we're going to go through this. There's so many narrations of... He pulled out the clothes, he pulled out this, she had this, she had that About the Messenger of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Okay, so that's like dying hair I don't know if there's anything I've left out, Mulana That we can, or Mulana from anyone as well But I think the khidab is something that, I think that covers that That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's is, is the redness like, it's, it's a red dye Yeah, yeah, yeah Okay so it's, it's some sort of redness okay. within a dye. A dye. Yeah. Any dye. Any dye. Okay. So it's not a dye itself, but it's just some sort of redness that goes within that dye. Okay. That makes sense. But then, like, they, they, they say katam is black and hinna is red. This is, yeah. This is, by the way, there's so much ikhtilaf on here. It's not that. It's a redness within a dye. Okay. Um, I have this one narration that I think is, we could quickly read uh, on this. This is Abu Rimtha at Taymi radiallahu ta'ala who says, I came to the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa and with me wa ma'i ibn li. This is hadith number 43. And I had my son with me. فأريته, so I showed him the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. لما رأيته, he's never met the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam before. He said, I said as soon as I saw him, هذا Allah. This is the Messenger of Allah. This is just the ulama bring this, it's just that people in the first instance that they saw him would just be convinced that he had to be the messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he says upon him were two green cloths and he had hair and there was some whiteness in his hair and the whiteness of his hair was red, which is the, the, the perfume that he would wear sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would show redness in it. Okay, so the next um, is the kuhl 
or we, we, we could call it the chapter or the Babu Majafi Kuhli Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the chapter on um, the use of antimony by the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So another thing that they mentioned that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would keep very close with him is his, he used to have a little bottle of antimony, Kuhl. And, and so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would use this. Um, but before we get to the Kuhl, the idea of the eyes of the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what, the, what, what we seem to know is that after the ru'ya of Allah, after seeing Allah Ta'ala on the mi'raj, something very different happens to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and there's a marked improvement in his eyesight but in a miraculous way incredible, like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam now can see things in a way that nobody else can see them and so he says Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that I can see in the dark like you see in the day that he has this incredible vision, the Messenger of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that once he was leading the prayer and the Sahaba Ridwanullahi Alayhim Ajma'in behind him started to they were distracted in the prayer and they weren't maybe concentrating as, as much as they should have. And then the Prophet Sallallahu turns to them and he says, don't think that I don't know about the way you're doing ruku' and the lack of khushu' in the prayer. And they say that the Prophet Sallallahu could see behind him. That's from the khasais of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Because when he, to see Allah, that Allah Ta'ala gave, this, this, gave him this ability to see himself, just expanded his vision to the extent that the Prophet Sallallahu could see things. That nobody else could and that's not just to say like, you know in a spiritual sense I'm just talking in a physical sense and then they even have a narration Shaykh Abdullah Sa'id al-Lahdi rahmatullah alayhi brings that the messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Could count the stars and constellations That he'd see now some ulama say this is a weak narration, but that he literally that I don't know I don't know a scientific miracle or whatever, but he was like he could see he saw a constellation, he said there's 12 stars. And they said later we found out that that constellation, the Arabs thought had five stars, that actually used to have 12 stars. But the Prophet saw it. And, and he loved to look at nature. He loved to look at nature. The Prophet Wasallam would, would look at the sky. He would look at the stars. They say that the Messenger of God, Wasallam, two of the things that he loved to look at were greenery, khadra. He loved to look at plants and trees and forests and these things. They really brought happiness to him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we'll come to that later maybe even next week then inshallah is that his favorite color is green that his favorite color is green sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but there's this 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 deep deep affection that he has with the color green and so he loves looking at greenery he loves gazing at nature and the second thing that the prophet sallallahu loves to look at al ul jari flowing water that he could just look at it would bring him happiness Right now, this is like now they're saying, you know, if you have anxiety or depression, go out and look at these things. But the Messenger of God, because he was nature, he was fit. When the Mi'raj, he took nature when he took the milk. And so the Prophet is at one with these beings because they're at one with him. And so, like we said about the eyes that the Prophet has, now he can, he can see, like Ya Salman, he saw Salman for the first time and he straight away knew who he was, Ya Salman. And he's like, well, how do you know who I am? But the Prophet ﷺ has this deep penetration of being able to see things. And more importantly than that, or maybe not more importantly, but as important is the fact that because he could see things for what they were, they could see him for what he was. And so this idea that everything in existence that he came across would bear witness that he was the Messenger of God wasallam. Many, 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 many narrations about the pebbles, about the food, about the camels, about the birds, about the lizard. That anybody, anything, trees, the palm, the trunk that he used to do the khutbah on, whatever it was, would acknowledge him as the Messenger of God وسلم, because they saw him, because he saw them. And so he had this deep, deep, Understanding of, of things as they were Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And so They mentioned that the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would use ithmid He would use kuhal on his eyes Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He would use it in odd numbers So there's a difference of opinion how that worked out Now some say that he would do three in the right Every night, generally at night before he used to go to sleep He'd do put kuhal on his eyes And Ibn Qayyim says it's because then the eye is resting And so the kuhal can work what it needs to work but the Prophet ﷺ would place it in his right eye and then he'd place it in his left eye. Most dominant opinion. I know there's a lot of ikhtilaf on things like this. They get really into it. But generally, or he would do two, 
two and then share one between two eyes. So he's actually done five because the Prophet ﷺ loved to do things in, three, uh, in odd numbers. Because in Allah with, you hibbul with. Indeed, Allah is odd as a number, as in his one, and Allah Ta'ala loves odd things. So try to do everything you can in odd numbers. So the Messenger of God وسلم, when he would do that, and so his recommendation is, alaykum bil ithmid, use ithmid. Ithmid being the, um, this very specific type of antimony that you can get. And so he says, use ithmid, فَإِنَّهُ يَجْلُ الْبَصَرْ وَيُنْبِتُ الشَّعْرِ That what it does, it, it fixes the eyesight, it causes a magnifying of the eyesight, and it also causes the eyelashes to grow. And that's why the Messenger of Allah وسلم, is recommending this. And so there's a, there's a thing about, you know, some of the scholars say, oh no, well if it's not... The one thing I will say is, the ulama make this caveat that if it's not beneficial for you, don't use it. That if actually it's going to cause more harm to your eyesight, don't use it. Because the Prophet ﷺ himself is giving what? Medicinal advice. That is good for your eyesight. So if it's not good for your eyesight, don't use it. And that's, that's some, one of the things that the ulama say. But generally everything that the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa sallam does, is, um, there, there is always goodness in it. But that's what the Prophet ﷺ, he would use kuhal every night. Okay, I'll begin, as in start the next chapter and then I'll finish inshallah. So the next chapter is, and this is probably what we're going to cover next week now, is all of the things regarding the clothing of the Messenger of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the only thing I'll mention today right now, and this is what Shaykh, Shaykh Yusuf al-Nabahani begins this chapter with in his text, is that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the most humble of people. And his, clothing, his clothing reflected his humility. That the Prophet ﷺ was not extravagant in his clothing. The only times that the Prophet ﷺ would wear expensive clothes or look really try to look in, in an extravagant way is on the days of Eid or on the days when he would be in the company of people. Because the Prophet ﷺ would say, if you're going to meet your brothers, then dress up for them so they don't, you don't look scruffy. But generally, that's what recommended that the Prophet ﷺ was very, very humble in his clothing. The Prophet ﷺ had patches in his clothes that he would sew with his own hands, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That, and many of the Sahaba are like that. If you look, I sent it to Sir and we, maybe we can share it somehow, is if you go to the top kapi, the one that really blew me away is you can find the shirt of Sayyidah Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha. And it is one, you look at it, you, you'd be embarrassed for, a, for, a, for a, like a homeless person to wear that. Like I'm just being real. Like if you saw that, you, you, you just think, why? How can somebody wear that? Because the, it was like the process of the clothing that he wore, his family wore, it was so coarse. And the shirt's all ripped and it's got patches and you can see it, you can see it. It's like one of the most remarkable things about the inner wealth that the Messenger of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has. Because in, that is him, in spite of the fact, Utitu mafatih kana'iz al ard, that I was given the keys to the treasures of the earth, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. That's what I had in my hands. I had it all, everything. All the wealth that this earth contains was in the, is in the hands of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He had, he was the first Prophet to be given war booty. He was the first Prophet to be given, kings would send him gifts. That the Messenger of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had this immense ability to take any wealth that he wanted. The, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to the extent the hadith of Sayyidina Umar, that everybody knows, right, the famous one, in that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he comes to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he sees the marks on his back from the fact his bedding was so coarse and the Prophet, and he says to Sayyidina, uh, Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, well why don't you, you know, the, you know, Kaysar and Qisra and these rulers of Persia and the Roman Empire, they've got all of this wealth. So, so well, what about you, O Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? They're kings and you're the Prophet of Allah. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah tarda an takuna lahum dunya wa al akhirah. Are you, Ibn al -Khattab, are you not content, O son of Khattab, that they have the dunya and we have the akhirah? Is that not contentment for you? Does that not suffice you, Ibn al Khattab? Anhu. That was the Messenger of God. He was so, so humble in the way that he presented himself as the Messenger of God. And that humility was what's so powerful. And that's why I, I love, because I love, I love to finish on a story. So I'll, I'll finish with that story, the Qissa Tawila. It's not a long story. Imam at tirmidhi says this is a long story. But he's, he's being... This is an interesting one. Is that This is hadith number 66. So we're going to go back and forth, it seems. But um, that uh, Duhayba wa Ulayba, who are the grandmothers of this, of this narrator, they narrate 
عن قيلة بنت مخرمة رضي الله تعالى عنها who says قالت I saw the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم رأيت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وأليه أسماء مليتين كانتا بزعفران I saw him he was wearing worn out clothing his cloak he was wearing the cloak it was worn out he'd worn it for a long time it looked old disheveled that's what the messenger of God صلى الله عليه وسلم was wearing and she says that in his hand he was holding a little stick and he was sat in, in like his head bowed in this incredibly humble way this is the power of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam That in that moment of the most immense physical humility from the visible eye They say that the woman who comes to see him She begins to tremble in his presence That's presence That's presence The dunya doesn't give you that presence Nothing gives you that presence Just it's the haiba, the nur that Allah Ta'ala places in your heart that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had And she begins to shake in his presence And then the Sahaba, he can't see because she's on the side And then the Sahaba, Ridwanullahi Alayhim Ajma'een, they say they have to shout out, Ya Rasulullah, Ar'adat Miskina. She's shaking like thunder. Look at her. And the Prophet says, Alayki Sakina. Be still. And then straight away she goes, Fadhahab anni ma ajid min al Everything just went from me. That the Prophet told me to be calm. And everything became calm. Because that's the commandment of the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so next week we'll start looking at the clothing of the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's some very interesting, I think, narrations in here that we're going to unpack. And then we'll do the khuf and the na'al, uh, the socks and the sandals of the leather footwear and the sandals of the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then we may look at uh, I think we're going to spend next week mostly his lifestyle, his clothing, his ring, and things like that, inshaAllah ta'ala. So we'll finish with that. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows these gatherings to be a means of gaining closeness to the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah ta'ala that he makes them an evidence for us and not against us. We ask Allah ta'ala that in this incredible month of Rabi'ul al-Awwal, he allows us to use it as an opportunity to take on many of the great sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah ta'ala to send abundant salutations, mercies and blessings upon him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and also send abundant mercies upon the author of this text, Imam Abu Isa At-Tirmidhi rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi and all the great authors of the Shama'il of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Subhanak Allahumma bihamdik wa nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruk wa nashadu There's no questions? Does Imam Tirmidhi say that it's a kissa tawila or is it part of the narration? Ah, it probably is the narrator to be honest, that's a good point Let me find out There's a question from a young man that you mentioned that uh, the prophets are alive, but if they, did they die, and then have they come alive again, or do they just not die, and are they alive? That's, that's an area of immense sophistication as a concept, because some ulama have addressed this, but it becomes very difficult. There, all I'll say is there's a moment of passing. There has to be. Because otherwise the death of the Prophet is not a death And it didn't happen then at all But that's Babu Maja Fi Mawti Rasulullah is one of the last chapters We're going to read together So he does have this, this passing into the Barzakh But the, the, the thing the ulama will always say Is that his soul has a special relationship With his physical body in, in, an, in a way that is very unique And that the Prophets generally Have a very incredible very unique relationship between their souls and their bodies which is why you know that it's haram upon the earth to eat the bodies of the prophets of god in that nobody's allowed to marry the wives of the prophet after he passed away concepts like these seem to reflect this idea that he has no inheritance you know the prophet has no inheritance now people will say no but that's because and there are other reasons and that's true but one of the things that ulama extrapolate from this is that's from the effects of him not passing away as well in that he's alive and so these things are, are things, and even if you don't accept that as reasoning, uh, the fact of the matter is that Imam Suyuti narrates that this is tawatur, that this has been mass transmitted. The concept of the prophets being alive in their graves has been mass transmitted. That's that's it, and so that means that we have to accept it as a point of aqidah to the extent of the Quran, in that there is no denial that the Prophet Sallallahu if not that one hadith being mass transmitted as a concept. That idea that the prophets are alive in their graves is mass transmitted. And denial of that could be kufr. That's the extent that it goes to. And so we definitely believe that the prophets are alive. And there's so many that the deeds are presented to them. I was reading Ibn al-Jawzi today. And he's like, he quotes a narration. And he says in there, from the, from the effects of sin is huznun nabi. From the effects of sin is cause sadness to the prophet ﷺ. Why mention that? If how is he getting, gonna get sad? How does he know these things? What awareness does he have of the physical realm if he's all the way over there? And then the idea on the Mi'raj that he sees the prophets. 
what does he see? Now there's all of oh, they're clones and this and that. And Allah knows best. But generally, those seem to be the prophets. That's who he's talking to. And he says, as he's going, I saw Musa alayhi salam praying in his grave. And then on top of that, I mean, if you just want to take this further, is the idea that the, the, the martyrs are alive in their graves, as by testimony of the Quran, and the prophets have a higher rank than the martyrs. So why is that so inconceivable as an idea? And then even further than that is this idea that we have, this idea that people are alive in their graves who are not prophets. From the idea of the man who's heard reciting Surah Al-Mulk in his grave, which is in the Sunan of Imam Tirmidhi, if not the Shemayim. So this idea that there, there are so many narrations of people being alive, this living, the barzakh, and I've not been there. So all we have on these unseen matters is the testimony of he who saw them, right? Who had that vision that he was able to see these things and he saw them and they saw him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so this is, this is, I mean, there's a lot more to this as an idea, but generally, yeah, we definitely believe that the prophets are alive in their graves. Was that the question? Okay. <laughs> it's become a bit of a controversial issue in recent times. No, but I, the idea being that there's inna kamayyitun wa innahum mayyitun. That Allah says in the Quran, indeed you will die. So something happened for sure. Now, what it was, I don't know. And I don't think anybody really, really knows what happened in his passing.